What is up, everybody? Welcome to Deep Dive Sessions. My name is Mpomo Taurirwa. As always, we're back again with another video. We're back again with another insightful episode with some of your favorites, some of the people that we look up to, some of the people that are doing amazing things in this space and business. And today, we have an amazing guest in the space of agriculture. This is a young, accomplished farmer who will introduce herself to us this, this evening. So ladies and gentlemen, help us welcome to the show, Kushata Mwesi. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming through and you know, for, for, for spending time with us. It's gonna be a very good conversation we're gonna be having. Mm -hmm. But before we get into anything, um, really, obviously by the time this episode comes out, we would have had the, the farmers conference yeah. and you are a speaker there and we're very excited about that. And so I just wanted to let people know about that. Um, Ushata Mwes. First of all, talk us talk to us about just the space of agriculture. Um, you're a young farmer and you're in the space that has it's letting the retiree, it's letting um, people, you know, that are much older. Mm -hmm. And you have really kind of created your voice and carved your own space in that field. Um, whether you agree or not, <laughs> you have really carved your space there. And so let us know, first of all, where you began, okay. um, where this love for agriculture came from. All right. So before I begin, two things. If I don't correct you on how to pronounce my name, I swear my father will hunt me yes, down. Yes, it's Kushata. Yes. Kushata. Yeah, there's a yes. TH at the end. It's no Ta. Problem. Cool. And then second, I don't really like to... Not like, I wouldn't really say I'm an accomplished farmer. Mm -hmm. I prefer aspiring farmer. Mm -hmm. I'm still in the works. I'm you old. know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in the works. Yes. But yeah, um, this farming journey... It's, it's, I can't really say it's been a wild one because it's still ongoing. It's pretty wild. Yeah. It's a roller coaster. I know a lot of people say that, but it really is a roller coaster. With me, it started when I was a little girl. I'd like to say um, the first stage was influence. My dad used to take me to the farm. I used to tag along with him. Mm. And it wasn't just my dad. There was my uncle too. There were my, grandma, my, my grandparents and just some other family members. And then it gradually grew into curiosity. So now I'm going to the farm now. I start asking questions. Okay, what's this? Why does this happen? And you know, how do I do this? Why do you do that? And then that grew into interest. Now I'm getting really interested in everything that's happening around me, the way things work. And also remember Gao Layano. Mm. And then the next stage was passion. Now I'm actually starting to like what's happening, what I'm seeing, um, the breeding of animals. Um, I'm starting to like and love what the money from animals can buy me. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm a child and we're being manipulated by, oh, pass your standard seven exams and I'll buy you this. Yeah. But where does the money from this come from? You know, mm. um, such statements like, um, and then it eventually grew into love so for you money. Were the cash cow king yeah. From the, the, <laughs> so the I'm like, oh, so this is where the money comes from. <laughs> yeah. I love this, you know. Okay. So now it's growing from like to love because I now realize what exactly I can get from having these animals. You know, it it, it became a thing of. Um, taking care of things that take care of you. Mm. And so I pursued the journey of farming, even though unfortunately after high school, I didn't proceed to the University of Agriculture. And trust me, I regret it. Mm. And um, I'm not going to blame anyone for a lack of proper career guidance. It was just a thing, yeah. Mm. Oh no, okay, I got an average grade in my sciences, I'm good. Mm. I can proceed on to university, not knowing that my love for agriculture is gonna um, force me to go to the University of Agriculture, but I need my sciences. I said, nah, yeah. I'm not doing that, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. So I pursued something different, um, event management from the university, from Lim Cooking University. And I thought, you know what, I can actually merge events with agriculture and do agricultural events. Look at that. Yeah. So I graduated and instead of going straight into the corporate world, I went to the farm. 
Mm. And that's where the experience really started. Mm. I mean, it did start when I was in university. I had a small backyard, Golapeng. I started with rabbits and quail and chicken and eventually went on to having some goats at the farm. And I realized that these little things are such high maintenance. Let Mm. me go for the bigger stuff because already I was taking care of my dad's cattle. Mm -hmm. And um, later on, I got my own. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Nice. You said influence, curiosity, interest, interest, passion. Mm -hmm. I love how you put it. Yeah. And so I I think you're the first person to ever put it like that Mm -hmm. because I've sat down with a lot of um, successful entrepreneurs. And I think a big, a big question or a big something that they want to do is how are they able to pass this on to their kids? And I've even talked to different <laughs> entrepreneurs in the agriculture space who say, mm-hmm. How was she able to get her into farming like this? I can't yeah. pronounce it okay. Yeah. I made <laughs> sure way. that I don't miss it this time around. Mm. And so I love it. I love the way you got into it. So first of all, where do you, th- you you went there as a little girl and then they kept bringing you into it like mm-hmm. that because there's the stereotype that a lot of youths don't like getting into agriculture we feel yeah. like it's just a lot of hard work and all that and i think granted some of our parents bring us into it when we are much older and we've developed stronger interests yeah that it's very hard for them to bring us back to this mm-hmm. and so you went into cattle farming and you were learning basically from your uncles and your dad Talk to me about that in terms of the experience of just working with them. Mm. Um, how were they? How were they developing this interest for you? Because I think that's very, very important. Yeah. Yeah, especially because this has to be passed on. How were they developing that interest? Um, I think the major thing was them believing in me. Mm. It didn't feel like they took me and they threw me into the deep end. Mm. They were there, they supported me and they listened to me. They believed in me so much that any time I had a suggestion or an opinion, I wasn't shut out. Mm. Um, the farm. I was actually a part of those meetings as mm. young as I was from 19 years old. Okay. So I had a say in what I felt should be done because also remember that um, the way they did the farming was more of traditional. Yeah. It was a traditional method. So I was awarded or afforded the opportunity to bring in the more uh, newer modern ways of doing things because you know I read I research I watch a lot of videos I go around I visit a lot more farmers so then I come with all of those ideas and what I've seen in South Africa what I've seen in Zambia and all of that and I'm like how about we try this mm. and they never refused so um, we would try it and it would work and yeah nice yeah I think that's very important eh? mm. I think that's very important now now let's talk about cattle farming itself mm-hmm. and just the whole space of it. Um, you said you started first with chickens and then you, you graduated yeah. and went up into that. And now you, your thing is now cattle, really. Mm. So talk to us about that. What is your approach to cattle production? Um, I want to start out in cattle production. What would you tell me? Mm. Okay, so the thing with me is I later really appreciated where I started mm-hmm. with the rabbits, the smaller animals. Because the thing is, with smaller animals, you are forced to be very precise in the way you handle them, mm. and the way the whole husbandry, you know, like the um, the housing, the healthcare, um, the breeding. It's all so precise, and it's something that you have to actually pay quite a lot of attention to the breeding when it comes to smaller animals. That was high maintenance, but it trains you. Mm. And moving on to medium-sized animals, the goats, I got to then learn what okay. Um, well for me remember this is for me Mm. things like goats sheep uh, or pigs or whatever you can't be so far away from them now remember I'm in Gabs and um, the ranch is like 450 to 500 kilometers away so it's very hard to monitor or maintain these things how about they something is wrong you can't just leave like that so with those animals I learned that they need to be probably a radius a, uh, a radius of like a hundred kilometers Mm. if at most so that if something is wrong you can quickly just dash to them Mm. now i don't really like saying this but i'm just gonna say it because it makes people think that cattle don't really need that much attention which they do Mm. but the thing with cattle is 
I'm more comfortable with Dikomo because I can leave for two weeks. I come back and everything is still fine. Mm-hmm. It won't always be fine, but chances are everything will be fine. Well, in comparison to in these comparison animals. to the smaller animals, right? Um, so the thing with um, entering this cattle space, from my experience, the story you wanted, mm. um, I I see I'd been taking care of my dad's animals. Mm and gaining that experience that I knew I would need when I start my own production. And I think I worked on my business plan for about three years, three, four years before I finally approached um, the financer. Mm -hmm. And wow, I was so humbled. I was very humbled. Um, One thing, it's a very tedious um, process, but if you really, really, really want that money to buy those cows, you Mm. will you will go through it without any complaints. Mm. So I'm I'm gonna use hypothetical figures here. Mm -hmm. Let's say I went up to this financer and I'm like, um, 500,000. I wanna go buy animals. I can buy this many. And then I start doing the the projections that by year two, I'll have this many, that many, that many. Remember you're doing all the figures in your head. You know, you're doing Facebook maths, as we like to call yeah, it, yeah, you yeah. know. You think you have it all planned out. Cool. Um, I provided everything that they asked for. The loan was approved. Great. I'm excited. I'm already budgeting. Oh, my word. Can I, can I just take you back a little bit? Because mm-hmm. I think somebody's watching this and they want to know mm-hmm. what are some of those things that finances are looking for in terms of getting finance for your home. Yeah. Yeah. If you just touch on that, then you can. Yeah, 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 sure. One thing I got to realize is that what they put on paper is not exactly what they're going to tell you when you get there and ask for money. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll want security. I remember they wanted security from me and I'm like, I'm just a girl. Yeah, you just finished varsity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At, th- at that time, I think I was 24, 25. Mm-hmm. I'm like, where do you think I'm going to get security from? I don't have a house. I don't have a car. Okay, I had a car, but like, I mean, you know, yeah. I had nothing. I had nothing to offer them. And so they were like, no, um, if you have parents who are willing to offer you some land mm. or collateral. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> but I'm anyway. Glad that you understand why they would want it. Yeah, because, no, come on. Yeah. It's a bank. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So um, let's just say I got the collateral. Okay. I got the loan, but some issues came up Mm. can't really say what but some issues came up the amount the 500,000 that I had asked for I it was approved but I couldn't get the money and then after some advice from some wise people wait did I answer your question about like what are the things The specifics Yeah they'll want security You get what I'm saying mm. But you just need to be smart On what you present Because um, Security doesn't always mean Your land Your um, Cars And all of that Yeah And they'll also want to see Some sort of a track record To see yeah. that Okay You're asking for 500,000 But do what you really you know What have you done yeah. You know Show us that You really want this Yeah So what can you show us You really want this Yeah and You can handle this money You can you handle this well. money So I had to show them um, Record keeping they're mm-hmm. so big on record keeping yeah. I had to show them previous sales That I had done for my dad and for the ranch mm-hmm. I had to show them the current animals that I had That okay look um, This is what I have I'm working with this right now It's not much but it's what I have mm-hmm. um, What else do they want? They want quite a lot They want quite a lot of commitment mm-hmm. Yeah It's it's tough Yeah it's also money I mean It's money They need to make it back So mm, They yeah. want to see that you've tried To get the knowledge that is required In Handling such projects And mm-hmm. with me I had your um, I have quite a lot of uh, Short course certificates From I was going to ask that Do they want yeah, Educational those background really, Yeah So your Le- For example Leah has um, Short courses on um, Entrepreneurship Development Sales mm-hmm. and marketing Record keeping I've done all of those When I was like 17 18 Um I have like three or four uh, certificates from Buan livestock management, breeding, all of that. So that that kind of convinces them that okay, no, she knows what she's doing. Let's let's take a risk on her Mm -hmm. or with her and all of that. 
So yeah, um, going back to that story. Yes. Um, someone wise said to me, um, Kush, don't, don't give up. You get what I'm saying? Mm. You're not really being denied to do that thing you love. It's Just not a blatant go back. No. Yeah, go back yeah. to the drawing board. You know, um, when some things are bad, like, don't try harder, just try smarter. Mm. Try different, mm. you know? Mm. And that's exactly what I did a year later when I reapplied for the loan. Now, remember I had asked for 500? This time I asked for half of that. Mm-hmm. For half of that. Okay. And I got it. But now I said to them, I don't have collateral. The collateral that you want, I don't have it. I'm 26 years old. Where do you think I'm going to get this money from? Mm. So I'm offering you this, this, this and that. And they were like, okay, cool. We see that you have the qualifications. You've actually increased your qualifications. Um, your mentorship is very good. Your track record is very good. Your sales, your record keeping. Cool. Have the half. Let's see what you can do with this little. And once you've paid up 50% of this loan, then you can come back for a top up. And I was like, hmm. You and can trust come me. Come back for a top up. I was like, that Look was the day. best. That was the, the best thing to happen to me the best thing to happen to me that gave me a lesson to learn that it's easier to start small Mm. yeah you can think big but it's easier to start small yeah and before you know it you're gonna be go that big that you've been dreaming of and probably Mm. way beyond Mm. yeah it's easier to just bite size Mm. you know so you're able to handle everything you're able to handle everything I love it yeah because I think it happens a lot even in entrepreneurship where a lot of startup funding gets misused mm. because somebody has never used has, has never received this that amount much. of money so they don't know how to use it or not. Yeah. and also not having many teaches you to be creative mm-hmm. become very creative and True. you know how to be able to figure things out yeah. so I, I love that and now when you started um, the the when you started your farm um, I don't know if you're um, I'll, I'll ask about this later on talk to us then about um, an issue that a lot of farmers want to know about which is cattle breeding um, just in the essence of your framework to it mm. how do you think about it and what are some of the things that farmers should start thinking about mm. and some of maybe the new things that you have kind of the new information that you have gained so far how do I answer that you don't have to that? spill all your secrets I mean <laughs> by like, <laughs> no, I mean like how? no we're not gatekeeping anything here yeah I'm just wondering how to answer that I like that um like I said, take care of what takes care of you. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, these animals don't give me money every month. Yes. Unfortunately, I find myself in a, uh, myself in a space where I need to have other income for now. Because mm-hmm. remember, the returns don't just come like that. Mm. I'll probably start getting proper returns in like the next three years. Mm. Um, another thing we need to remember is that... Um, in this journey you have to fall and rise and fall and rise mm. i've made so many mistakes i'm probably about to make my next mistake again i yeah, don't know yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. all i know is i'm gonna get up actually before we even go there yeah. I think you, you touched on something very important um which i think is the lifeblood of business which is cash flow mm. um talk to me about that mm. because um i would assume that your kind of business is where you will get a big pay check and then for some time you won't get a lot of money a dry spell. this is big and then so how do you manage that yeah that cash flow problem um this is a very tricky topic because mm. everybody always wants to know about that yeah but it's always landed me in a bit of a fix mm. i've had a bit of backlash just a bit where people were like oh she doesn't really feel the pinch because Silver spoon, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's just it's it's what people can say from the outside looking in. True, but also, um, before I get to that, what I will say and what I've always said is, I did not choose to be born into the privileged space that I find myself in. Thanks. However, what I feel and what I strongly believe is that it's 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 a gift to me from God. Mm. Now. Now God is watching. He's trying to see how I use this gift. Mm. How smart are you or how dumb are you with what I've given you? I have the privilege um, to use my parents' resources, my family's resources in getting or trying to achieve what I want. I would have been very stupid not to. 
you get yeah that's all i can say i mean <laughs> so what i'm trying to drive to is with the support of my family i have had times where i had no money at all to support these animals but my family came through for me mm. they were not obligated to but because they understand the passion i have for farming for cattle mm. they wanted to yes so now with these big fat paychecks that come once every year or twice every year depending on how your breeding plan is mm. you need to be very smart in how you use them if it's 100,000 at zena from the sales mm. you deduct your uh, what you call it the salaries mm-hmm. you need to know where how much will you need for supplements because i don't we don't feed our mm-hmm. animals are on the veld it's like free range yeah free range mm. but i mean you'll have a few um exceptions like the old the sick yes. and all of that you just need to know what are the major things the most important things that you need to buy before you can think of getting a a nice car or going on a yeah. holiday or reinvesting mm. you get times like these right now where climate change is at probably its highest yeah we are strongly advised to um reduce our our herds reduce the population now what this means is it doesn't really mean if you have 500 animals sell 250 no mm. it means you have to now get into a very strategic uh, method of culling the animals culling not killing culling um is where you remove let's say the old ones that will not survive the season mm. um yeah you could remove if you have some males ship them off to B, uh, bmc and stay with animals that are in such good condition that they'll survive mm. until the end of these harsh conditions mm. so yeah um this uh, the financial part is it's tricky mm. it's tricky i don't know how to put it for you but also with when you're like me where you ask for a loan um you really have to have someone who helps you with these um accounts baba tawo bana go dirisa madiang you get your account i can't be just swiping everywhere with that mm. card because then ba go ipotsa go really can we really trust you with this top up that you're asking for yeah 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 but um in terms of profits and finances i always try to make sure to reinvest it wasn't just with the cattle but even with the chickens and the the goats anytime i had to sell for example if i'm taking out 20 like i did actually just a few weeks ago if i'm taking out 20 cattle um i get the money i buy what i need to and then i assess do i need more breeding stock at a time like this no okay cool let's um invest on something else like um I got a bull for example mm. I didn't need to get a bull because I am a qualified artificial insemination technician mm. but because now I have a full-time job I can't do that I can't be at the farm for a month to make sure that my animals dig up and all of that so I got a bull mm. and why did I get a bull the bull is helping me while I'm here mm. yeah okay mm. okay makes sense makes sense And so let's actually get into that with the bull. Um the cattle breeding itself. Mm. What is your framework around it and how do you think about it? All right. Um I actually spoke about this a couple of weeks ago on Twitter. Mm. Um I was just thinking out loud. You know, mm-hmm. I can wake up at 5 a.m. and just start tweeting because yeah. I like to think that on Twitter I'm alone. I'm just tweeting for myself. And there's actually people who are following and they're yeah. so interested, which I think is lovely. Yeah. Um so At first I wasn't so sure what I wanted to do with this cattle breeding thing. Mm-hmm. My dad has always done it for beef. Obviously here and there you'll get some people who want you to sell some breeding stock for them, um to them. Yeah, you could sell bulls, a few um heifers, a few this and that, mm. but I got really hooked to the beef sector. Um and then I realized um later on the headlines were always on some our herd population is going down it's going down um the quality of our beef is just not good anymore so i mm. went deeper into that trying to understand why what is causing mm. all of these issues okay. and then um the president started that initiative via the bull donation i'm one to say i've never been really shy in you know picking out a few things i wasn't really happy with some of the quality of the bulls that were being donated and i said to myself we're trying to fight um qualitya 
the mm. national herd. Mm. So then we need to be using proper genetics, proper bulls. Then I thought to myself, the problem is a lot of farmers are into the stud breeding where we're breeding the the really top genetics and so therefore the animals are going to be very expensive your 50,000 mm. 100,000 mm. and I asked myself that question that can an average Motswana farmer afford this no even with the auctioning animals are very expensive yeah, so I said to myself I think I want to get into a space where with the cows that I have which are medium framed Tswana animals that's the breed we like to call it Tswana I can if I have medium framed animals and a proper bull, it could be a stud bull, and I breed these animals for bull production, I sell these young bulls um, at 24 months old, that's two years mm. when they're ready to actually start serving the cows, and then pricing these animals strategically in such a way that an average Motswana farmer can afford them. So that is why I also went for the training, yeah, bovine artificial insemination. It's because I had a vision, I had a goal that I want to go into bull production, but not mm. the bull production that you see where you're buying bulls for 50,000 and 60,000. I mean, if it's worth that, okay, cool, but I'm mm. trying to reach a market that I feel we have suddenly forgotten about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes sense. Mm. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, artificial insemination and also the natural way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Um, which one do you think works for you and why? And which one would you use at which point? Yeah. Well, the thing with um, the method of breedings that we use at the farm, my dad's been using um, the controlled breeding. Mm. Um, controlled breeding basically is just where the bulls are separated from the females until breeding season. Our breeding season starts from last week of December to first week of April. So this is done um, so that the bull has maximum coverage time to serve all the animals. Mm. And I like this method because then once on the bulls and a few months later, if you're a person who does pregnancy diagnosis, pregnancy test and all, mm. but when they start calving, you're able to tell which cows are productive and which ones are not. Mm. Now, the difference between Botswana farmers or not even Botswana, black farmers and Boer farmers or white farmers is if a cow does not calf this season, mm. it's out, it's gone. It's not going to survive another season on the farm. Also, you take it out immediately. You take it out because basically it has cost you a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's how they see it. Our problem is that we give second chances. We believe in second chances. Mm -hmm. We're like, nah, let's just try it again next season. Mm. Oh no, maybe um, the ratio of bulls to cows was not good. Maybe that's mm. why it did. We're always in denial. We never want to accept Jorge. This animal just isn't productive. I mm. hate um, okay. So it's worked for my dad, you know, sometimes. And then there's the AI. The AI um, is still pretty new on our farm, but we have gotten some pretty nice animals from it. Now, my problem with AI is it won't always work 100%. I've heard of people who are able to produce 100%, but, you know, when you get 50 to 60%, Apparently that's good. So usually what people do is they add a bull mm. to kind of do like a sweep, a cover up, just okay. in case one okay. of them or 10 of them didn't conceive. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Okay. And so, um, all right, there's a lot to talk about here. And just in terms of this cattle breeding thing. So I'm just going to be speaking my thoughts out. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the, the good, just that how you're dealing with the, with the, with an animal during that. Um, is it gestation period mm. when it's pregnant? I get it's plus or minus 180 something days. Nine months. Yeah, yeah. It's basically nine months like a human being mm. and how you deal with them. Yeah. Um, I want to understand that. And also, yeah, let's just get into that. Then I'll get into the other thing. Yeah. Well, we're not, we don't do intensive breeding. It's just free range. So we don't really like to put much thought into that. Mm -hmm. Once the bulls have been removed from the cows, we let them go mm -hmm. into the veld. And I mean, obviously we'll give them certain supplements to help them um, like, like, you know, with, I think with the goats and the chickens, I used to give them what was called a stress pack. Mm. Um, with cows, not really. I'll just give them certain supplements to make sure that um, the development of the fetus is really good, the calf mm. inside, um, reduce stress. 
and that's it. Mm-hmm. There's not really much. What about right now with these conditions? Like the the heat is just crazy. Mm. I mean, there's heat stress that affects animals. How yeah. are you dealing with that? Yeah, um, times like these, you just make sure there's enough shade for them, mm. enough clean water for them, supplements. Mm-hmm. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Enough shade. Enough. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. All right. So, what about the ratio now of bulls to cows? Mm. What is your thought process on that? Um, the advised ratio of bulls to cows is 1 to 25. Ah, I actually yeah. had that in my mind. I should have said mm, it. <laughs> it's 1 to 25. Yeah. Um, you're almost 95% sure that that one bull is going to cover all of those 25 females. Mm-hmm. There is, however, <laughs> it's a very funny thing. Bulls can be picky. Mm. And I've seen this with people who are in a communal setup, Mumera Gang, mm. where let's say in the area, Le three, mm. you have a really nice bull. Everyone else doesn't have a bull because they know that the Ahokopana out there in the wild and yeah. what happens there stays there, but it's obviously it's going to come to light. Yeah. Um, a bull can actually reject the cows that it stays with mm. and want to go serve your neighbor's cows. Yeah. It happens. Um, I think we're just always in denial about it, but it happens. Yeah. Even in a fenced uh, farm, mm. most of the times it's not that the cow is not productive. The bull just doesn't want that girl. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> how do you how do you how do you work with that? Like how do you work around that? Um, well, there's other bulls. Mm-hmm. If you've noticed that your bull is rejecting a certain group of girls, you swap them, take them to a different bull, and if the same thing is happening, then you just call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're not gonna force them. You just call. Okay, mm. so basically your advice is that we should be very observant, observant, but mm. also decisive with things. If it's not working, stop it. Mm. So you don't have to continue. And the other question I really had in mind was, what is the cost of one cow? Um, I don't know if you have run these numbers for yourself or you think about them in the way I'm asking this question. What is the cost of like a cow? Um, because um, I usually, I, I know that this is a, a, a problem, especially for us, if I'm mm. we just don't account to all of these costs. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we realize that we're not making as much as we should be. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously right now, I can't tell you that for me right now, mm. the cost of one cow, Melissa Ken Lame is 500 gula or, mm. but obviously the easiest or the most basic way of calculating it, one, you calculate, <clears throat> If you're a weekend farmer, mm. you're going to calculate how much fuel you use to go there. Yeah. Two, you're going to calculate, you're going to factor in... Feeds. Um, before that, salary. Mm-hmm. Your animals. Yeah. And then the supplements, the ear tags, the vaccines, or rather the uh, the vet's bill. Um, I can vaccinate or rather administer certain uh, medicine on my animals, to my animals, but mm. we prefer, because we're EU compliant, it is advised to have a vet go do that for you. Mm-hmm. Because when you're EU compliant, kind of there's standards that you have to comply with. So you take all of those costs, whether you have to fix the borehole, the solar panels need to be, all of those costs stuff, um, take them mm. and then divide them by the number of cows, by the number of cows you have. Mm. And then you get your unit production cost yeah yeah i think that's mm. very important eh? i think that's very important to actually look at and now in terms of just the farming itself um you have talked about how you were able to kind of how you're actually merging traditional and um traditional and like the newer modern, stuff modern yeah. stuff so talk to me about some of your learnings in terms of just the modern stuff that you think farmers can can get into or something that you think farmers are really like sleeping on um, can't really say much on that because mm. our farm, you know, people have this image. Yeah, our farm is so high tech. It's what? It's mm. not. Newsflash, it's not. It's yeah. literally, I think the only thing that I, no, not the only thing, one thing I really love about our farm is the way it's been paddocked. Mm-hmm. 
Most people prefer to just have their animals running wild, mixing together. You have no control when it comes to that. So mm. the way our farm has been paddocked is there's the center where all the water points are, the homesteads, the kraals and all of that. Mm. And then it's been paddocked into eight other sections, okay. um, which will probably be around 450 to 500, he 500 hectares each. And, you know, the pregnant animals will go into one paddock, the bulls into one. The female um, hyphas, um, female hyphas, the hyphas yes, into one, the tollies into one, helayalo, and we just work like that. Not all of them will be full, we just rotate. So the mm -hmm. rotational grazing is what I feel puts us at an advantage and um, well over other people. Mm -hmm. As for high technology, we don't really have high technology on the farm. Mm -hmm. um, it is something that I would like to Excuse. experience and explore like your embryo transfer i've realized that you don't really have to have like an intensive type of setup to have embryo transfers done you can have them at the farm just as long as the monitoring what the are observation those? so embryo transfer is kind of like it's not really far from artificial insemination oh you said embryo, embryo. i thought you said embryo I'm no like, no no embryo, embryo transfer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah okay i didn't yeah. Uh, my bad mm. i'm not i'm the one who didn't hear you yeah there's nothing really spectacular mm -hmm. about it mm. it's just okay. normal okay yeah all right so um in in your journey if you if you just look back at your journey what are some of those um what is what is most instrumental to or some of those instrumental networks that you have mm -hmm. or resources that you have mm -hmm. that you think farmers can tap into um in terms of just you know having people that you know okay if i have this mm. i know i can talk to that yeah. if there's a problem like as we also get into the issue of diseases because i also want to ask you how you're dealing with those mm. and also in different um geographical locations because that yeah it affects I mean, cows are affected by different diseases at different places. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm one person who's been attending a lot of farmers' conferences, networks, meetings, mm. anything where farmers are going to be gathered together. I will be there, be it an auction, Farmers' Day, be it so I'm there. Mm. Um, and I'm very grateful to myself that I did that and I made that a tradition because then, you know, once people start seeing you over and over again in a, a thing of who's that person? Mm. Who is she? I saw her. Have you seen her? Mm. You know, I always see you at this thing. Hi, can I get your number? Cool. And next thing, one thing leads to another. Your contact details have been entered into a database where now when there's conferences, when there's um, people from East Africa coming to Botswana or send a lady invitation. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Um, and also just being able to not being shy, mm. being able to speak up and ask questions and have an opinion, but being respectful also at the same time, mm. understanding that we're all from different places. Um, yes, but yeah. you know, when you have something to say, be you need to be very careful in the way you approach these things because we're all about very sensitive, especially when it comes to cattle farming. Yeah. You know, so um, these farmers shows that happen all over the country. I made it a point to attend almost all of them and meet them um, because like you're saying, there will be a time or there has been times where, for example, we've bought cattle from South Africa, Limpopo, we've bought cattle from um, Namibia, we've bought livestock mm. from Kalagadi. And now the area we're in has um, the tick, blue, hot, um, hot water tick. Mm. So now the areas that, most of the areas that we buy cattle from, you find that they're coming from a place that isn't, um, they're not used to this take. Yeah. So now we're bringing these animals into a new environment mm. and I need help in how I'm going to take care of these animals. How you to know? help them adjust. Yeah, mm. you get it. So it helps coming from um, knowing people in different places, mm -hmm. um, getting different opinions, different methods on how to take care of animals. Um, for example, there's this, what do you call them? Dikakan. What do you mm. what do you call dikakan? Like skin tags or mm. warts. Or, yeah, warts. Um, cattle have this tendency of getting that stuff. I had no idea that, that that thing was contagious. You get. So I asked around about it, and Facebook. Facebook really helps. You can literally just throw in a question, and you'll get different answers. Um, one thing I've also 
made it a point to do is um, acquaint myself with vets. So when I have a problem, I will call one of the vets and say, this is what's happening. And they'll just give me um, a solution. So um, those mm-hmm. dikakanas that I'm talking about, for example, mm-hmm. someone would say, and there's always crazy answers, guys. Yeah, You'll yeah, have yeah, someone yeah, tell yeah, you, yeah. oh, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, battery acid, you know, just rub it on. And I'm like, yeah. okay, you know. And then I got, um, someone was like, call me. Here's my number, call me. I yeah. called them and they were like, okay, contact your nearest vet. They have to come and get samples. Um, it's an autonom- uh, auto- autonomous, autogenous, autogenous vaccine type of things, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah. Okay. Okay. What about diseases, though? Mm-hmm. Um, what diseases have you dealt with at the farm in terms of your cat, and how are we able to manage that? Because I know hard water on it's ish, it's crazy. Yeah. Able to Um. In terms of diseases, nothing out of the usual. Okay. We're very strict with our vaccine schedule, um, and when we forget, because it happens, our vet will call or set, um, send us a reminder that you're due for this and that. Mm-hmm. However, um, one thing that I learned is to always be cautious to wear gloves when handling, yeah. especially when an animal has died. You know, we try to do postmortems ourselves, which we shouldn't. And I learned that the hard way. There was a time um, a cow died and what's happening because in it like the blood was a bit darker than what it's supposed mm-hmm. to be and so we opened it up and we're there like we're looking we're searching what looks right what doesn't yeah. look right what's swollen so then um i got onto the net when i got back to gabs and i'm just checking i i i had a feeling it was anthrax mm. it was anthrax and now I'm panicking because I was breathing in that air. Yeah. I touched it, you know, everyone. And usually with anthrax, what's supposed to happen is you dig a hole, you burn and yeah. all of so that. Nothing... Yeah. So ever since then, I make sure to be very cautious when handling these animals. But in terms of diseases, um, we've had a bit of a scare with foot and mouth disease where the yeah. buffaloes came a bit too close to the, oh, wait, uh, the, to the fence heavier. Yeah, in our zone. But we haven't really had... Okay. Anything bad, yeah. Okay. What, what what has been your biggest challenge though in, 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 in just running the farm, everything? Just from your journey to, to, to till today, what has been your biggest challenge? And even just how were you able to overcome that? I don't think I've gotten there yet. Mm. They haven't tested you yet. Um <laughs> I don't really think I've gotten there yet. Remember Kana, I'm still like I said, I'm an aspiring farmer. Yeah, I'm yeah, yet yeah. I know I'm yet to experience all of that you've not had a problem that has you that had had you up the whole night no no obviously um i'm just trying to think it's i can't i don't want to say them and then ah, it's it's the usual we're in an area where there's quite a lot of wildlife Mm -hmm. um there's a lot of elephants a lot of what you call them leopards a lot of hyenas now we're getting a lot of wild dogs um, it's an issue of where the elephant probably destroyed the boundary fence. Yeah. The animals left. I remember all the animals left this one time. We got them back. The elephants came back and then they destroyed the kraal. Mm. Um, there's, there's, there's not much right now mm. that I can think of or say. Wait, you said, you said that the elephant broke down the fence and then the cows left. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So you don't know where the cars away. Luckily like in our area we don't really have much theft where someone can come with a trailer and just mm-hmm. load all your animals. I think it's also a big thing for farmers yeah. in terms of tracking mm. the, so, the cattle. So we have we have the air tags and then we have the branding and all of that. So luckily someone noticed that okay, those animals belong to that place and then they mm-hmm. herded them back and then I got a call. I remember I got a call and I was able to call the guys at the farm to be on the lookout to go make sure that the fence is fixed, go get the animals and all of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, dope, dope, dope. I think it also speaks to issues of also double insurance. Yeah. In terms of insuring cattle and all that. But you know, the thing with insurance, um, insuring animals, it mm-hmm. works best or easier for stud farmers, stud producers, because mm-hmm. you know you bought this animal, 100,000, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. going to insure that animal. <laughs> it makes but you yeah, more. but when you have like 
Tswana animals, Tswana animals. What you will try to do is ensure your bulls. Mm. Yeah. Because they're the biggest producers. Mm, and then maybe ensure the farm or something. But mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. So before I ask my last question, what motivates you to, to keep going? To wake up every morning to do this and also just the balance of work and and running the business? Well, I don't know. I'm just really grateful that this is a passion that runs really deep. I don't think there's anything that can shake me right now. Nothing. Nothing Mm. can shake me. Nothing can deter me. I don't think I can go astray when it comes to farming. Mm. Um, I also love the fact that I started really young. I see now a lot of um, elderly people, Mm. um, they're struggling because also there's they're stressing about how much money they're using mm. and that they're only going to start seeing returns when they're in their 60s and 70s. Mm. At least in now I can say I'll probably be rich and be a millionaire by the time I'm 40 Come or something. Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> I don't know. I'm Let's just go. saying. But, you know... Yeah, um, I think 40 is far though. I think it you're is being, you're, I think you're being too... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm being modest. Being modest. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But the thing is, you know... At the end of the day, it's not just farming, getting dirty. Um, the, the the I mean, yeah, it's not a hobby. Mm. Also, one thing, it's not a hobby anymore. It's now a business. We're in this to make money. You get. Um, also, when you look at the holistic picture, the overview. At the end of the day, it's not just farming. It's agriculture. It's mm. issues of food security. Now, food insecurity is not just my problem because Kirile Karata farming. Exactly. Unfortunately, it affects you, 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 Everybody. you, and you. It doesn't matter. Mm. If something is going wrong in the farming industry, just know it's going to affect you just as much as it affects me. Mm. So um, I find myself in spaces where now I'm doing a bit of advocacy, you know. I'll have to wear a bit of formal, go talk about like the issues of food security, of climate change, like we were doing just the other day. Mm. So, um, I'm mer- I'm very motivated about farming, and you know one thing is, um, I keep talking about grassroots. Um, I want to get to a point where I can actually facilitate some sort of a training, a brainwashing, mobile or a farming. Mm-hmm. I've always said that um, I believe. <clears throat> Each child needs to have some sort of a backyard farm. Yeah. It doesn't have to be anything hectic. You could literally have like a raised garden bed. Um, teach this child to sow seeds. These things. Have a little chicken coop. Have a little um, rabbit cage. You know, responsibility. It's not just about farming. It also instills a sense of discipline and responsibility in a child. Yeah. They grow up knowing that food is very important. You need to put in the work, but also there's rewards. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. Hey, get out of ready to go, Mister. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Um, my last question for you is: How do you want to be remembered, Eskushat? Hmm. Hmm. A trailblazer. Mm. Um, unfortunately, I don't know of any women in Botswana. Well, I didn't grow up with a woman in mind. Hore, this woman did cattle or this woman was like that. I'm only getting to know of them now, mm. um, which is uh, it's nice because then I get to like reach yeah. out to them. But I want a space where young women young girls can grow up with me in their mind that oh she didn't actually go to the university of agriculture she didn't get like a formal training to do all of this but she made it a point that she was gonna learn come rain or sunshine i made it a point i'm making it a point that i want to learn um i want to get into those little spaces i want to see what's happening um i want to learn certain skills so that i can when i hire someone you get what i'm Mm. saying Mm. so i want little girls young women to be able to kind of um, push their way into industries or spaces where they've been told that okay no you're not suitable for this or Mm. it's going to be challenging take the challenge Mm. you know Um, you really need to get out of your comfort zone and I think that's what I'm doing right now by having an eight to five I am struggling (laughs) God knows I am struggling. My friends know I complain every day because I'm now trying to adjust to a new routine that I'm not used to. Mm. You get, but um, I made it a point that, you know what, I'm going to get used to this. 
You're it creating has to a be, formula. Yeah, mm. I'm creating a formula. Um, I'm not going to be, um, hopefully I'm not going to be in this corporate world forever. But, you know, the discipline, I felt like the discipline is what I needed in order to try and achieve more things that I want, especially when it comes to financial discipline. Mm. I felt like maybe I was lacking a bit when it came to financial discipline. Now with the job, um, my dad has also told me that, hey, you're going to have to step up your financial um, responsibilities at the farm. Mm. So now I know that month end, um, I Love need to... Money. Hey, I mm. need to send money there, 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 and there. So yeah, um, I want to be remembered as okay. This is probably not a <laughs> the it girl in farming you get, mm. but someone who really made it possible for other girls to go into that space, who showed other girls that oh, okay, it's not as hard as it seems. Can be done. It can be done. Mm. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. I'm glad you ended with that because that's exactly our mantra, ladies and gentlemen. It is possible and it can be done. I hope you guys have enjoyed Kushata's story. I hope you guys have learned a lot as much as I have. Please dive into her work and dive into her story, dive into everything, all the links to her socials will be below so that you guys can connect with her. But without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we'll meet same time, same place next week. Be great. Thank you guys for watching this episode. We really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Deep Dive is dedicated to bringing you the most comprehensive and engaging information about business, personal finance, and personal development. Make sure to hit that subscribe button to stay updated with all our latest content. If you liked this video, give it a like to show your support and help us reach a wider audience. And don't forget to share this video with your friends and your family who may be interested. Sharing helps us grow our community and connect with like-minded individuals. Leave a comment below and give us your biggest takeaway on this episode. If you're interested in being a part of our live studio audiences, make sure to register for the next show. Can't make it to the show? No problem. Check out our Patreon page to watch the full episode and get exclusive access to more great content. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next episode of The Deep Dive.